Hello everybody, greetings and welcome to resource.com.au. I'm Peter Cass. This is a new segment I've put together called Minutes to Mastery. So I've got a few minutes to actually go through a synopsis of a full topic for you uh, and basically to give you a clinical summary that you may go away and use in your emergency department or wherever uh, on any particular topic. So this is a bit of a challenge for me. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do one of these every week on the website. Please send a link to this to other people if you think that they're going to enjoy it uh, and if they can learn something from it. Email me at info at resus.com.au. Let me know what you think of this segment and also give me some topics you'd like me to cover. Let's have some fun and here we go. Just before starting, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, coming to the GP conference that we had recently, the GPC conference that I was invited to speak at. And we ran some airway workshops and arrhythmia and simulation workshops. And we had over 100 people at those workshops. And I wanted to thank them because they played all out. You guys did a fantastic job and I'm sure you walked away with a lot of useful information. Uh, a lot of people have asked me about the workshops and about doing the full day one. These workshops were an hour. We basically put a day's work into an hour. Uh, the airway workshops we have running at the moment, I've got one coming up in Melbourne in February and one coming up in uh, Sydney in March. If you go up to the top here at the end of this talk, there's a workshops uh, button across the top. If you hit that, it'll take you to the workshops. Um, I hope you'll come along and join us at those. A lot of people have a fantastic time there. Pretty much we deal with everything to do with the emergent airway we, and the conferences or the workshops are accredited by the Australasian College of Emergency Medicine for MOPS points. I hope you'll take the time to come along and join us. Okay, so here we go for the syncope talk I'm going to give today. I'll give you a talk on syncope, three minutes and 33 seconds. Let's see how I go. And you'll notice my beautiful background. I'm in my study at home at the moment. It's a Sunday afternoon and... Uh, Somebody painted my study pink, so I need to change that at some point. But um, enjoy the talk. B. About 5% of all emergency department presentations are syncope, and about 10% of all admissions into hospitals are due to diagnosis of syncope. Now, syncope is difficult to deal with because syncope is a symptom. It's not a condition. It's important to define it. Syncope is a sudden brief loss of consciousness plus some postural tone loss plus spontaneous recovery. So the patient loses consciousness, falls, collapses, and then spontaneously recovers. When a patient comes in, we need to work out whether they've had a fit or a faint. Now, usually in a faint, they'll have two-thirds of patients will have a prodrome syndrome, they'll be sweaty, there'll be some giddiness, not rotational vertigo, because rotational vertigo means it might be an ENT or neuro cause. They'll also have um, some spots before their eyes sometimes, and the patient will collapse, lose consciousness. They may bite their tongue, but that'll usually be the tip of the tongue as opposed to a fit where it's the lateral aspect of the tongue. They'll have no loss of sphincter control and they'll wake up fairly quickly and uh, they'll be with it. In contrast, in a fit, they'll take some time to wake up and usually if they take more than five minutes to wake up, we will be concerned that they've had a fit. They'll tend to bite the lateral aspect of the tongue and they will probably have some tonic-clonic jerking and they will lose control of their uh, bladder and bowel in some cases. Uh, let's be careful with convulsive syncope because onlookers will come in with a patient and say, oh, they had a seizure. But what they're seeing is myoclonic type jerks that occur in patients that are having a syncopal episode due to decreased cerebral blood flow. And they tend to be symmetrical jerks. And yeah, I'm about to have some now. They do this as they're collapsing. And so be very careful uh, of the history. You need to take it uh, in context of everything else that's happened to the patient. So the causes of syncope, well, we've got neurally mediated syncope. That's a normal vasovagal faint, some noxious stimulus, and they pass out. Then there's the situational, which we call cough syncope, micturation, defecation syncope, where the patient strains through coughing or micturition or defecation, and they valsalva, and they pass out. Psychiatric, remember, there are about 2% of cases of psychiatric syncope, and these patients will pass out but not actually have a cause apart from their psychiatric illness. However, just because they have a psychiatric illness doesn't mean they don't have a, 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 um, a sinister cause of syncope. Uh, medication can cause it, orthostatic hypotension can cause it, such you know, autonomic dysfunction, Chydraga syndrome, etc. We need to be careful with the two biggest causes. If we have a syncope secondary to a neurological cause, uh, there is two times the risk of a fatal or non-fatal stroke occurring than in those patients that didn't have syncope. And in patients that have cardiac disease where we don't pick up that the cause of the sink is being cardiac, um, 
and they are discharged, their mortality uh, can reach up to 30%. So we need to be very, very careful. And we know that syncope and some heart disease and an abnormal ECG is associated with an increased risk of mortality at one year. So we need to make sure we ask these patients, was there a prodrome? What was it like? What were they doing? Were they standing? If they're standing and they collapse, it's a neurocardiogenic cause. If they're sitting or lying down and they lose consciousness, it's potentially an arrhythmia that's caused it. Uh, was there head rotation? That may relate to carotid sinus stimulation. Was there severe sharp pain, glossopharyngeal uh, neuralgia can cause syncope? Is there a family history of sudden cardiac death? And were there any other associated symptoms? Because we need to go fishing for the causes. So was there rotational vertigo, such that it may be a posterior circulation TIA? Is there abdominal pain? Have they got a triple A? Is there severe uh, tearing chest pain that occurs? Do they have a thoracic aortic dissection? But just remember that about 13% of patients with a uh, thoracic aortic dissection present with syncope as their only complaint. So we've got to look for these other things. And of course, the examination will go looking for these other things. In terms of investigations, really the electrocardiogram is the main investigation that we'll do. Blood tests may not give us a lot of help. Now, a full blood count may be helpful if we think it's anemia that's caused it. Certainly if we're doing electrolytes and we believe the patient's hyponatremic, that will usually not have resolved if they're coming to. The same applies for if we're looking at a low glucose. It's very rare that a patient with hypoglycemia that's had a syncopal episode will wake up and, and with their hypoglycemia intact. And we may need imaging if we're thinking of one of these other things occurring. So we may need a CT of the chest or the abdo for aneurysms and dissections or a, a CT head for a subarachnoid. So we need to do that. Um, we need to look at those investigations and do them as appropriate. ECGs become important because we don't want to miss things like arrhythmia, so Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, ventricular tachycardia, Brugada syndrome, which I've spoken to people about, and we'll have a separate lecture on that uh, in the very near future. Um, so do the ECG. If we don't have a diagnosis for syncope, there's certainly a, a place for tilt table testing where the patient is, is tilted from a horizontal position to an almost vertical position. We look at what happens to their blood pressure and to their heart rate. And then we can work out whether they've had a neurocardiogenic cause of syncope. If in really difficult cases where we can't work out what's happening, uh, we might use an implantable loop recorder which records for arrhythmias. And in one case or one uh, study that was done, almost 50% of the patients had an arrhythmia. And, and now this is going down the track where we can't actually work out what the cause of the syncope has been. Our job is to risk stratify these patients. And so there is a rule called the San Francisco syncope rule, which has about a 98% sensitivity, 56% specificity, and some validation studies are showing some different results, but it's a good one to remember. And it's made up of five elements, and we remember it by the word chess, as in the game. So C, congestive cardiac failure, H, hematocrit less than 30%, E, ECG abnormality, S, shortness of breath, and the last S, systolic blood pressure less than 90. Allows us to predict a higher risk group for uh, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, arrhythmia, death. So chess, and I would also add to that, age greater than 45 years, uh, just to make sure that we've got those patients that... Uh, are in the elder population. I'm over 45, I don't consider myself the elder population, but we are a higher risk group. I would also add one other group on those that have had a family history of sudden cardiac death uh, in case there's an inherited syndrome such as Brugada or something else. So risk stratified. Well, that was a synopsis of syncope. I hope you find that helpful. A few minutes and we're able to look at the topic. Now, the topic's in a lot more detail on the website. So if you go into the curriculum or lecture section or whatever it's called up there, you can have a look at some white papers and also some PDF slides. Uh, please, if you haven't already, register up in your top right hand corner. Hit the register button and you can register for the website. It's all free. Enjoy it. Send a link of this to somebody else. Pass the message on. Uh, spread the education around. I think it's uh, going to be very helpful. Uh, I look forward to your feedback and I look forward to meeting many of you at our workshop. So please take the time to come along. Uh, until next time we meet, I'm Peter Cass. Keep well and remember to learn for life. Goodbye for now.